I hope you can write fast and listen fast. Chris has been a blessing. Glad he can preach for us tonight. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. And if I miss a blank uh, and you care terribly much to learn it, just come approach me afterwards. It's okay. I'm, I wind up being forgetful and sometimes I lose my place. So it may work to your advantage. Um, but before we go any further, let's pray. Um, Father, uh, thank you for this evening. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd be with everyone in this room. Um, so, some, so many people have experienced losses recently and um, are struggling with medical issues either for themselves or for other people. Um, I pray that you would help us as we persevere and uh, follow you through everything. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So tonight we're going to be looking at James chapter 1 and mostly verses uh, 1 through 18, really more focusing on 1 through 15. Um, and I think I might have forgotten to write a title, um, but the title would be uh, Trials and Temptations. And it's when I started looking at the, at the chapter, um, it's, it uses the word temptation every time. So I don't want you to think that like, I'm going to like hammer you about sin. I don't want you to think that. I want to more encourage you that as we go into seasons of our life where we might experience hardship, to be aware of those seasons developing and to keep our eyes on the Lord to prevent us from falling into sin. Um, and just a little bit of like kind of context for this book. James is writing to, as he says, and I'll, I'll read a little bit. So starting in verse one, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and, and abradeth not, and, and it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So James at this point, and it's kind of interesting, James contextually, we understand from a couple of different passages in the Bible, is actually the leader of the church of Jerusalem. He is kind of a big guy, but he's not actually an apostle. He is the brother of Jesus Christ. Um, Paul actually references this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and in First, in uh, the book of Acts chapter 21, we see it's this man, James, who is the leader of Jerusalem who Paul goes and visits. And at that point, as we know, for a lot of us, we know that in Acts early on, persecution started and Jews started leaving Jerusalem and they started going to Asia Minor, going north into modern day Turkey. And by this point, and also by Acts 21, you have to ask yourself, why is it that James is the leader of Jerusalem and not Peter? And it might be that Peter has been arrested by this point and may have actually been executed by this point. So there is pressure being put upon these believers. When, when James is writing this letter telling people, be careful of temptation and be careful of trials that you're going through, he's not fussing at somebody for like little sins. It's that there is a lot going on in their collective lives, spiritually and practically, and he cares about them but is wanting for them to be, be aware and discerning. So the, the first couple of blanks, we should pursue joy despite temptation and hardship in life, and not only comfort and stability. And a lot of times in, in church generally these days, in America, like you know, churches in Romania, other parts of the world, have a lot of hardship, a lot of difficulty that they go through. And, Difficulty, persecution is starting to develop for the church here in America. Um, but by and large, like things are fairly easy here in America. There are a lot of churches that are prosperity driven. Um, and God wants us to have good things in life. But God's main desire for us is to be spiritually mature and not just simply to be wealthy or comfortable. 
Um, it's, it's good to understand that there is balance. He doesn't want us to be monks. He doesn't want us to live austere. And he earnestly cares about us. Like Matthew chapter uh, 6, verse 26, Jesus tells us that, Behold the fowls of the air, uh, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than, than they? So God cares about us earnestly, deeply, but sometimes, actually, ultimately, his care and concern for us isn't in physical, material things. It's in spiritual things. And, and God can use various struggles to accomplish good things for us. And the reason I use the term various struggles is kind of referencing the diverse temptations. Um, because as James goes on, he starts to talk about different forms of struggles and temptations that we experience. In the, the original Greek, the term temptation is actually uh, pyra, I won't, I won't butcher it too much. If you look up at the top, it's the second word in parentheses, pyra boyas. Um, and that root word is used consistently throughout this chapter, but it doesn't necessarily mean sin temptation. It could be any kind of a provocation. It could be a coach telling someone you need to do better, or it could be a flat tire that you, that you get, and it's a struggle that you have to come overcome. The way that James is describing temptation is something that comes up on you from outside that you have to respond against. And God can use any kind of temptation, any kind of provocation in your life for your good and for his good. Um, and God uses temptation ultimately to develop patience and to help us pursue perfection. So James breaks down these struggles that we are experiencing, really the original audience, but us by extension are experiencing into two camps. There's physical hardship, and there's temptation that happens spiritually. And these are referenced in um, a little, in a couple of spots later on in the book. He kind of develops the idea, um, but in verses uh, 9 through 12, he talks about the kind of practical, physical issues of temptation, saying, let the brother of low degree rejoice in, in that he is exalted, but let the rich in that he has, uh, but let the rich in that he is made low, because the flower of the grass, uh, he shall pass like the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and uh, and the flower there uh, uh, falleth. So he's talking about these kind of practical, like tangible things that sometimes we struggle with. And then later on in James, he starts to really reinforce how these things can develop spiritually as well. So in verses 5 through 10, he is really focusing on and kind of highlighting how we should understand physical hardships. Um, trials and hardships are struggles, and we experience these externally. And it's, I, I, I kind of like the way that James approaches this, that we can, like breaking it down as like an internal thing versus an external thing. That we have temptations that are external. There are things that are done to us or that we experience, and it wasn't a sin that we had that caused this. It wasn't a bad motive that had. It just came out of the blue. And that was, a, that was actually a theological issue that Jesus struggled with with the Pharisees. A lot of times they thought that oh, well, something bad happened to that person. He must have a hidden sin in his life. And James is kind of affirming to these people who some of them may have previously been Pharisees, it's, it's not necessarily that you sinned. It's that bad things happen, but God is still sovereign through all of this uh, and encouraging them. And that's one of the problems of the prosperity gospel is it can lead some people to believe that just because my life is hard, that God doesn't love me we can see here that God loves people, that he loves those that follow him, um, and that external circumstances don't affect how God actually cares about us. Um, so the, um, we experience practical hardships that can be physical, financial, or socially related. 
and to kind of take you into first century AD for the Jews that you know had gone up in Asia Minor, they had left their homes back in Jerusalem. They're going to a new place, so they've left their work. They might have a trade that they can take with them, but the Jews are also very socially oriented. It's about knowing people, being part of the community. So if they go to some place out, like out of the country, and it's like, oh, well, why are you new in town? Oh, well, we're, we were following Jesus Christ, and we, we had to leave because of persecution. The Jews in town may not be welcoming to them. So they may be back at square one, like trying to start a new job, start a new community around them. And you know those kind of things affect us nowadays also. Like there's many people in this church that struggle with things physically. Um, financial issues have been rampant in the last couple of years. And in socially, things more and more in our culture are getting harder for Christians. Uh, like, you know, there's like, I, I saw on, on on a Facebook, I believe it was a teacher in California who's a Christian, wasn't relating anything to her students, but was posting online in her personal Instagram, like motivational Bible verses, and students in the high school found it and brought it to the school board to try to get her fired, even though she wasn't directing it to them at all. Like things socially can be difficult for, for us as Christians these days, um, and God cares about that. God really does care about that, and he knows what we're experiencing. And these, these external, uh, these are all external influences, and as I said earlier, um, they, they aren't a result of sin, not sin within us. A lot, sometimes there's sin within other people. Um, and God wants for us to seek him for wisdom, but not to waver in our faith. And like, you know, there sometimes, and it's, it's natural sometimes to, to wonder, to question, um, but God doesn't want us to put our faith in him, but also put our faith in something that's contrary to him. He wants for us to trust him, but also rely on him to help us through, do I turn left here? Do I turn right here? Do I slow down and just pray? Do I act now? He wants for us to reach, uh, to seek him out for wisdom in those, those decisions. And, and he is faithful to help. I, I know I have trusted in God in those ways consistently in my life. And the more that I have trusted him faithfully, sometimes faith to act, sometimes faith to wait, he has been faithful to me. Um, so I just I want for you all to know that that you know if you're in a if you're in a trial if you're in a struggle, God is there with you, and I think that it's interesting that James makes the progression the way that he he does because um, he starts directing it more towards sin issues and sometimes it's natural when things go bad in our lives we may say, oh well. You know, I did this, I did that, but things are going apart. You know, why, why should I trust God anymore? Like, I, I'm, I'm upset with God, I'm frustrated with God. And, but we need to stay consistent with God because it's in those times of hardship that Satan may start to target us especially. Um, and, you know, he, James doesn't say it overtly here, but it's interesting that it's the progression that Jesus went through when he was being tempted. He was led away into the wilderness by himself, physically, socially, so to speak, alone. He, physically, he's weak, he's hungry, and at the end of the 40 days, that's when Satan makes the big grand appearance and starts to really tempt him. And Satan, Satan is very crafty, but he does the same thing over and over again. So for us, he knows when we're tired, he knows when we might be tested or, or have been stressed about things, and that may be when spiritual temptation to sin pops up more. So I want to encourage you all in that in itself, is that whenever you're starting to realize, I am, it's been a long week, I'm getting stressed. It's like it's the end of the month. Oh man, like the budget's getting a little tight right now. I can't wait till, till the next paycheck, stuff like that. Be aware of those tensions and stresses that you have because Satan is probably aware of them also. And that's when he might start to try to twist in your family. That's when he might try to start 
tension with you and your spouse or something with your kids or all of a sudden you make an offhand comment to a coworker that you're like, I did not mean to do that. It's, it happens. But God is greater than that. God is merciful. God can overcome our short steps. And it's important for us to remember through everything that, let me make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself. <laughs> I don't, I'm getting used to going off of notes like this. Uh, so bear with me here. Um, but yeah, so God cares how we respond to trials. Um, and we need to be careful in how we respond uh, because it may wind up leading to sin. Trials and temptations come from the world, so that's the external direction that trials come. Um, but James also makes a definite point that we should not blame God for trials and temptations that we have because sin, the response to trials, comes from within us. Uh, he says um, in, in verse 13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with either, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath, has, hath conceiveth, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So it is important for us to remember this. The old adage, and we're in the South, we've all probably heard it, the devil made me do it. Apparently, for James's time, the adage was, oh, well, God made me do it. And neither of those are correct. When it's sin, it's an us thing. It's not a God thing, and it's not a devil thing. Their devil tempts us, but our desire and decision to respond sinfully comes from within us. When, when, uh, when we, uh, we sin, when we reject God, and when we pursue our own desires apart from his will. <clears throat> so... We, and that's the basic, a lot of times physically I can, I think about it, maybe it's because I did drafting for a couple of years. Like there's, you can go positive or negative, you can go that way or that way. So it's a lot of times spiritually we can say, I'm gonna look inward or I'm gonna look outward or I'm gonna look upward. And whenever trials start to happen, whenever we're experiencing temptation, whether it's external temptation or spiritual internal temptation, we need to look upward. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus um, and definitely not look to our own wisdom. Um, sometimes, and sometimes it's hard to just jump in the Bible and get wisdom on a, on a topic. The Bible has, has counsel for everything, um, but you can reach out to reliable brothers and sisters in Christ also. Both of you get in, in the Bible. Go to pastor and, and help him give you advice and counsel. Um, but you know, God will provide counsel. He will help you um, in the ways that you need. God's will for us um, in verses 13 through 15. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I might have might need to update that. Oh, I didn't update that that verse correctly. I'm sorry about that, people. My bad. Uh, <laughs> um, but God's ultimate uh, will for us is that God be glorified. Um, it's not necessarily for us to be glorified, especially in a foundational materialistic manner or comfort, um, but that he receives glory through our lives and that through that we become more like his son, Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus Christ was tempted. He was, and it's one of the confusing things. It's one of the things that this passage, I was kind of like, well, how do I navigate this? Do I even address this passage because Jesus is completely God. He was completely man. He was God, but he was still tempted. And, but he was tempted so that he can experience it and relate to us. Uh, he can be our mediator. Um, and that God allows us to go through temptations just like Jesus did because when we go through those temptations and when we glorify God through those temptations, instead of seeking our own will, being selfish and sinning against God, we wind up becoming more like Christ. Um, that's actually, for me personally, something a few times in my life that was uh, extremely encouraging. Um, like in 
not to go on a long like digression, but like right at the time that I was going to propose to Bethany, I lost my job doing something fairly comfortable, drafting, and I had to start doing construction work. So I'm like lugging like 50 pound barrel or like you know jugs of slurry cement up and down stairs on the site, and it's not easy. And I'm thinking to myself, why? Why is God allowing me to experience this? And I realize God is allowing me to experience this so I can become more like Christ. So the, the biggest comfort through all of this uh, is sometimes, and that's one of the reasons why I'm thankful for prayer services like this. A lot of churches don't necessarily do this, and people wind up in a place where they're lonely. They don't know if they can share things that are you know, hard for them, um, that God knows what you're going through, that it does matter, and that if you trust him, he will use it and redeem it for his glory and for your own glory. So, so I guess that's my, what I had to share. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Chris. That was great. Uh, we have about 15, 20 minutes to break off into prayer groups. That was encouraging. And uh, it, not easy to, to exegete 15 to 18 verses in, in 25 minutes, but you did a great job at it. So thank you, Chris. Uh, let's take this and let's think about that because we all go through trials and temptations. <laughs> Let's split off into some groups and pray, amen? We'll take about 15, 20 minutes. <clears throat>